Spin your passion into a business with Shopify and break sales records with the world's best converting checkout. Let's hear that one more time. The world's best converting checkout. Shopify's legendary checkout makes it easier for customers to shop on your website, across social media, and everywhere in between. Now that's music to your ears. Any way you spin it, you can be a smash hit with Shopify. Start your dollar a month trial today at shopify.com slash records. The French Revolution set Europe ablaze. It was an age of enlightenment and progress, but also of tyranny and oppression. It was an age of glory and an age of tragedy. One man stood above it all. This was the Age of Napoleon. I'm Everett Rummage, host of the Age of Napoleon podcast. Join me as I examine the life and times of one of the most fascinating and enigmatic characters in modern history. Look for the Age of Napoleon wherever you find your podcasts. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 3, Episode 8. The Murderer of the Scottish Nation. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. I'm your host, Samuel Hume. Before we begin, I have to thank the new additions to the House of Lords, Viscount Ryan, Ninja Boy, Viscount Leet, Baron Adrian, and Baron Ed of Pasadena. Like all other patrons, they can now listen to this episode and every other episode ad-free. Go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica to find out more. Last week, we covered the end of the English Parliament's campaign in Ireland. After Oliver Cromwell left to prepare to fight the Scots, he left his son-in-law Henry Ireton behind as Lord Lieutenant. Ireton would lay much of the groundwork for the future Cromwellian settlement of Ireland, and it is sometimes referred to as the Iatonian settlement of Ireland. But in the winter of 1651, while on campaign, Ireton caught an illness and died. But while this could have been disastrous for Parliament's campaign, he was considerate enough to die after he reduced Royalist Ireland to a small enclave in the province of Connacht. His successors would face an extended guerrilla war, but the back of the Royalist coalition was broken. As we also saw, the Marquess of Ormond, the Royalist Lord Deputy, was hamstrung by political, religious and ethnic divisions within the coalition, none of which was helped by his own failings as a political and military leader. Overly cautious, indecisive, and more concerned with holding up his crumbling personal authority than actually fighting a war, he wasted valuable time waging political battles against his own followers. He, too, left the Irish War in the winter of 1651, sailing into exile after months of ineffectual leadership. When he returns with the Restoration, Ireland will have been transformed by parliamentarian settlement. For now, we return to the island of Britain, along with Cromwell. The last time we saw Scotland, the news of Charles I's execution had sparked panic. The government, which was led by the Marquess of Argyll and dominated by the hardline covenanter Kirk Party, was outraged by the judicial murder of the King of Scots. They immediately followed what tradition and law required. The King was dead, so his heir was proclaimed his successor. It was only afterwards that the English Parliament abolished their monarchy, which made the proclamation of Charles II a diplomatic issue. Adding to the tension was the Scots' use of the royal title, King of Great Britain. Again, this was merely accepting the monarch's style. The Act of Union was still decades away, of course, but King of Great Britain had been established as a royal title by James VI and I. These two combined proclaiming the king, and proclaiming him not solely King of Scots, worried the new English Republic. Did they really believe that Charles II wouldn't push to reclaim his southern kingdom? Did they really think he would let the King of Great Britain become a phantom limb like the English claim to the throne of France? But as we saw in the first episode of this season, the proclamation came with conditions. Only if Charles II accepted those conditions 
would the Scots give him royal power, along with his royal title. The regicide, and the Edinburgh government's ham-fisted reaction to it, sparked a small rebellion in the north, where rebels under Sir Thomas Mackenzie of Pluscarden captured Inverness. The government army, commanded by General David Leslie, marched north to respond, and when we left Scotland in episode 1, the rebels withdrew from Inverness and back north, where we will pick up again. After Leslie reached Inverness, he sent word to the fleeing rebels, offering amnesty, and enough of them accepted it that he felt comfortable turning his army around to head back south. Because while he'd been in the north, Athol had rebelled under the leadership of the escaped engager general, John Middleton, and the garrison of the key fortress of Scotland, Stirling Castle, had also mutinied against the Kirk regime. Neither of these events led to much. Middleton's forces scattered at the sight of Leslie's army, and the Stirling mutineers were brought back into the fold fairly quickly. But this is where we say goodbye to the second Marquis of Huntley, George Gordon, Chief of Clan Gordon. This was the guy who had been such a pain for Montrose during the Year of Victories, denying his authority, competing for influence, and generally getting in the way. After the king surrendered to the Covenant of Forces in England and sent word to his forces in Scotland to disband, Huntley had held out, hiding in the Highlands until finally being captured in November 1647. He'd been imprisoned ever since, forgotten about by his captors until he could serve a purpose. That purpose came on the 22nd of March, as an example brought before the Scottish forerunner of the guillotine, the Maiden, at Edinburgh's Mercat Cross. Like her more famous descendant, Madame la Guillotine, the Maiden executed her victims by decapitation, and you can see a surviving machine in the National Museum of Scotland. Huntley was embraced by the Maiden, and since his eldest two sons predeceased him, his third son, Lewis, became the new Chief of the Gordons and the third Marquis of Huntley. The new Huntley was a different beast to his father, and with his inheritance, he became a more dangerous threat to the Scottish government. By mid-April, Huntley gathered a sizeable force of Gordons on Speyside, rendezvousing with the remaining rebels like Mackenzie, and the rebel force soon numbered over a thousand men. This prompted Leslie to turn right back around and march back north, but he needn't have bothered. He received word in May from a subordinate that he'd left to garrison Inverness. Colonel Gibby Kerr led around 120 cavalry out of the town in a daring raid on the rebel camp. With just over 100 men, Kerr killed about 60 rebels and captured 800. Any Irishman taken prisoner was summarily executed. It was a stunning victory, and though the rebel leadership scattered, including Mackenzie and the new Marquis of Huntley, they submitted after getting guarantees of their safety and property. The threat of royalist invasion was real, as we'll see in a moment, but the Kirk Party regime remained in power, and in the negotiations with their new king, they still held all the cards. At this point, Charles II sat in exile in the Dutch Republic, surrounded by fellow exiles from his three kingdoms. Those Scots in exiles were mostly former royalists and engagers, who had fought and lost for Charles I, including the Marquis of Montrose, James Graham. Montrose had enjoyed his year of victories I mentioned earlier, when he and Alistair McCullough rampaged through Covenanter Scotland, slaughtering multiple Covenanter armies and sacking Perth and Aberdeen. The sack of Aberdeen was particularly horrendous, and the Marquis's reputation in the city is still terrible even today. Needless to say, just a few years afterwards, his name was still mud to the Covenanters, which made it a bit awkward when the Earls of Lanark and Lauderdale arrived in The Hague to meet with their new king. They outright refused to be in the same room as Montrose, who likewise despised and distrusted them. After they'd been separated, Charles heard the terms under which he would be permitted to return to his ancestral kingdom and take up his royal power. The biggest condition was, of course, religion. And it was the same objective which had driven the Scots into rebellion in the Bishop's Wars. It was the same that had bought their alliance with the English Parliament. Lanark and Lauderdale demanded that the Solemn League and Covenant be implemented in all three kingdoms, and that Presbyterianism be fully established in the same. The Scottish Kirk would be secured through its dominance of Britain and Ireland, 
Further, within Scotland, Charles would have to agree that civil and ecclesiastical concerns were to be left in the hands of Parliament and the General Assembly respectively. In other words, Charles had to acknowledge that the Scottish Revolution had taken place, and that his kingship would not be an absolutist one as desired by his father, but a limited monarchy, answerable to Parliament and the Kirk. The earls also insisted that Charles refuse the services of, quote, the most blood murderer of our nation, this cursed man whose scandalous carriage, pernicious counsels, and contagious company cannot fail to dishonour and pollute all places of his familiar access, and to provoke the anger of the Most High God against the same, end quote. That cursed man was Montrose, who Charles had just made his Lieutenant Governor, Captain General, and Admiral of Scotland. Their hatred of Montrose for his year of victories aside, Montrose was a very vocal supporter of the type of kingship the Kirk regime would not accept. They wanted Charles to return to Scotland without these alternative sources of advice and guidance, or as they called it, pernicious counsels. Montrose was the very image of the evil counsellor, as far as Lanark and Lauderdale were concerned. Charles turned to his evil counsellor, and asked his new captain-general what he thought of the conditions. Montrose told his king that he saw no danger in accepting the National Covenant of 1638. Montrose was himself a classic covenanter. He had sworn to it himself at the time, and indeed had fought Charles I's forces in the First Bishop's War. There was nothing to fear from the National Covenant. But the Solemn League and Covenant was a step too far, and he urged his king to reject it. And besides, who did Argyle and his faction think they were? Charles II had succeeded to the throne by hereditary right, as ordained by God. He hadn't been elected, he had been chosen by the Almighty. The Covenanters had no right to insist on a conditional succession. Whatever concessions Charles II wanted to hand down was entirely his prerogative, but he did not need to haggle for his own crown. Over the following months, the Covenanters and Charles danced what Ian Gentles calls an elaborate minuet, in which both Covenanters and King repeatedly tried to double-cross each other. Charles was absolutely his father's son. His appointment of Montrose to high office, even if it was mostly theoretical, was deliberate. The idea of putting all his eggs in one basket never even occurred to him. So while the talks with Lanark and Lauderdale carried on in fits and spurts, he pursued two different paths. The first we've touched on, Ireland. He hoped to turn the island kingdom into a power base to take back his English and Scottish thrones. In June, Charles was forced to leave The Hague, because his presence there was only adding to the tensions between the Dutch and the English. He went to Paris, meeting with his mother, and from there travelled to the island of Jersey, he hoped to sail from there to Ireland after Ormond secured the kingdom, but we know how that turned out. If you're wondering, like I was, about the connection between the island of Jersey and the US state of New Jersey, this is the beginning of it. Charles II granted the bailiff of Jersey, Sir George Carteret, Smith's Island in the Chesapeake Bay as a reward for his loyal service. He excitedly named his new colony New Jersey and dispatched a ship to settle the new colony. But, fatefully, that ship was captured, and the colony was never settled. Not under that name, at least. But Carteret will get another go after the Restoration, where he'll get a much larger territory annexed from the Dutch, and reuse the name New Jersey. And this time it will stick. Anyway, Charles stayed in Old Jersey until February 1650, hoping that Ormond would resist Cromwell's Irish campaign. When it became clear he wouldn't, he found his way back to the Dutch provinces by March. All this time, his Scottish subjects in exile had been preparing for a royalist invasion of Scotland to reclaim Charles's crown by force, without needing to accept the Covenanter conditions. For this to work, the exiles needed guns, men, and money, and they spread out across Europe looking for it. Montrose was commissioned to negotiate within the Holy Roman Empire, and he would travel the German principalities, gathering sympathy and support for his young king. The Earl of Forth, Patrick Riven, 
who had defended Edinburgh Castle for Charles I and so earned his title, was sent to Stockholm to negotiate with Queen Christina and Chancellor Oxenstierna. He had been knighted by Christina's father, Gustavus Adolphus, during his time in Swedish service, and Forth still had many friends in the Swedish court. He managed to win the promise of arms and ammunition for Charles's cause, but with the caveat that this could not obviously come from the Swedes. Sir John Cochrane visited the court of the Duke of Courland on the Baltic coast, and he offered support for the Stuart cause. In Copenhagen, another Scot, Lord Ray, Chief of Mackay, negotiated with the Danish court. Patrick Guthrie went on a tour of Italy to see what help he could find there. The Earl of Crawford travelled to Madrid, where he reported the sympathetic outrage of the King of Spain, Philip IV, at the regicide. The Lord Chamberlain of Denmark visited the Hague for other diplomatic business, and while there, he loaned Montrose a small fortune in diamond rings to help fund the invasion. The Portuguese ambassador arrived in the Hague, and he met with Charles, and advised him to, first, proclaim liberty of conscience for his subjects, and then to request aid from the Pope. By June 1649, Cochrane reported that Scots had secured offers of support and aid from the Prince Elector of Brandenburg, Prussia, the Landgrave of Hesse, the Princes of Newburgh, Mecklenburg, Lundberg, the Queen of Sweden, and the Kings of France, Spain, Denmark, and Portugal. This was the international coalition which opponents of the regicide had always feared. The crowned heads of Europe were horrified at the murder of one of their own, and there was no way that England could possibly defeat them all. But they wouldn't need to, because words are wind. As soon as it actually came to call in those promises, they got excuses instead. Now, to be fair, a lot of these places were small, not especially wealthy, had limited access to the sea, and had just gone through one of the most devastating and exhausting wars Europe had ever and would ever see. Sympathy and limited financial assistance was easy to get, the regicide was seen as a genuine crime against God and humanity. But armies, they were another thing entirely. There would be no foreign intervention to overturn the English Revolution. What Charles and Montrose could muster was what Stuart Reed's calls a, quote, pathetically small force of Scots and English royalists backed up with a slightly more impressive collective of Danish and German mercenaries, end quote. They sailed to the islands of Orkney, off the northern point of Scotland, and captured the town of Kirkwall. The royalist invasion had landed. This was all part of the negotiation. Both King and Covenanter realised how much they needed the other. Their shared enemy, Republican England, was a threat to both a Covenanted Scotland and the House of Stuart. The government in Edinburgh, led by Argyll, was stuck between a powerful, independent-dominated Republic in England and the threat of royalist invasion. Charles hoped to build pressure on the Kirk party by threatening military force, and the capture of the Orkney Islands was the first step of that. Orkney was safe from Covenanter attack, and over the rough Orcadian winter of 1650, the royalist presence there grew. A militia was raised from the Orkney archipelago, and a few hundred more mercenaries arrived from Europe. But though its remoteness kept the royalist force safe from immediate assault, it also meant that it didn't really apply much pressure on Edinburgh. Argyll, hundreds of miles south, wasn't going to moderate his demands on Charles just because a few hundred mercenaries were holding an isolated collection of islands off the remotest part of the Scottish coast. By March 1651, with Charles back in the Netherlands after his ill-fated trip to Jersey, he decided to really give the Covenanter representatives something to worry about. Charles unleashed his not-so-secret weapon. James Graham, Marcus of Montrose, Lieutenant Governor, Captain General, and so-called blood murderer of the Scottish nation. His year of victories had once brought Argyle's regime to its knees. Charles hoped he could do it again. Before Shopify, were you wondering, where are my sales at? Now you're selling with Shopify, the global commerce platform supercharging your selling. You have no problem selling online, in person, on social media, and beyond. Gary, easy on the cha-ching. 
<clears throat> oh, sorry, but my Shopify sales are through the roof. Start selling with Shopify today and discover how millions of businesses around the world use Shopify to ignite their selling. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash listen. Shopify.com slash listen. Madame Tussaud. We all know the name, and many of us have visited one of the wax museums which bear that name. But you may not realize the historical significance of the woman behind the name or how she and her waxworks defined the genre of true crime. If that has piqued your interest, then give The Art of Crime a listen. The Art of Crime is a history podcast by Gavin Whitehead, a historian of Victorian theatre, all about the unlikely collisions between true crime and the arts. If you enjoy the detail of Pax Britannica, then you'll love The Art of Crime. The latest season of The Art of Crime tells two stories. First, it chronicles Tussaud's career, starting in pre-revolutionary France, and ending in Victorian London. Second, it tracks the evolution of the Chamber of Horrors, a showroom in her wax museum that exhibited macabre curiosities, including effigies of notorious criminals. You'll hear how Tussaud won patronage from the French royal family, narrowly escaped the guillotine during the Reign of Terror, and became one of the most celebrated showwomen in Paris and London. This season also covers the most divisive assassin of the French Revolution, the last man to be hung, drawn, and quartered for high treason in England, and the glamorous murderer who attained notoriety as a modern Lady Macbeth. Subscribe to The Art of Crime wherever you get your podcasts. Montrose soon set sail for Orkney with about 1,200 men, and, soon after arriving, put his plan into action. Sir John Hurry led the vanguard, and he crossed the Pentland Firth, the stretch of water between the Orkney Islands and Caithness, on the 9th of April. Hurry hurried, and he bypassed the nearby castle of Dunbeath in order to occupy the strategically valuable Ord of Caithness, a narrow road between the mountains and the sea. On the 12th of April, Montrose led the rest of the Royalist army across the Firth, and he was back on the Scottish mainland for the first time since September 1646. He set up a base at Thurso, and many of the local gentry rallied to the king's standard. It was a promising start to the campaign. And then it promptly nosedived. Montrose had banked on a surge of royalist reinforcements from the Highlands. He'd kept in contact with these old comrades from the Year of Victories, and they had shown that they were restless under the Covenanter regime. These included the Mackays, the Maclouds, the Gordons under the new Marcus of Hundley, the Earl Marshal, among others. And yet, they didn't appear, not in the numbers Montrose had expected. Gentles argues that these men, who had no love for the Kirk party, weren't ready to throw themselves behind the king until they knew what kind of deal he was going to make with Edinburgh. As well as Highland allies, the other chief ingredient of the era of victories was Alistair McCullough and his Irish Gales. McCullough had long ago met his end in Ireland. With neither of these two strengths, Montrose was also missing a third key factor in his earlier successes. The Covenanters were not distracted occupying half of England. All the advantages were with Edinburgh. Montrose was nothing if not self-confident, and after leaving a small garrison at Thurso, he marched south. He spent three days besieging and capturing Dunbeath Castle, and then left behind a garrison to hold that. Then, after meeting with Horry, he marched inland, crossing hills, and halted at Carbisdale on the 25th of April. So far, the resistance to his invasion had been minimal, and the road to Inverness was open. Stuart Reid suggests that, if he'd wanted to, Montrose could have taken the northern capital without opposition but this was not meant as an invasion of conquest, but instead was part of the wider negotiation. According to Reed, Montrose intended to solidify his position in the north as a means to apply pressure to Edinburgh and allow his king to come to terms with the Kirk party without making dangerous concessions. That was why he was taking it so slowly and leaving garrisons behind to maintain control. Attempting to conquer the kingdom would have been incredibly difficult. The government was not beloved, but it had shown it was secure enough not to crumble after a battle or two. If he'd pressed on, it would have meant another civil war which Scotland could ill afford, and even if the royalists had then won it, the kingdom would be in no position to defend against an English attack or, indeed, 
press Charles's claim to the English and Irish thrones. News of the invasion soon reached the Covenanters, and on the 25th of April, David Leslie called a muster at the Angus town of Brecon, which, as an aside, has a very nice cathedral if you're ever in the area. He prepared to march north and deal with Montrose. But Leslie wasn't the only Covenanter commander around, and Lieutenant Colonel Archibald Strachan was closer, and was one of those northern officers ordered by Leslie to hinder the Royalist advance. Well, Strachan would take those orders and run with them. Edward Cowan describes Strachan as a ruthless soldier, unafraid of Montrose's reputation. He also firmly believed that God was on his side. Perhaps Montrose's worst failing as a military commander was his underappreciation, perhaps, of proper reconnaissance. And he'd had plenty of opportunities to learn. More than once in the year of victories, he had almost been caught out by his enemies because he didn't know where they were until they were nearly on him. His defeat in 1646 came about because David Leslie caught up with Montrose when he wasn't expecting him. Despite these harsh lessons, Montrose never did learn and at Carbisdale, he wouldn't get another chance. Strachan approached Carbisdale on the 27th of April. He had four troops of cavalry, around 230 horsemen in total, as well as a small force of veteran musketeers, numbering about 30-odd. On the march north, he was joined by another 400 local militia, but in total they were still outnumbered by Montrose's force, small as that was. Strachan prepared his men for battle with psalms and readings from scripture before giving a speech, quote, Gentlemen, yonder are your enemies, and they are not only your enemies, they are the enemies of our Lord Jesus Christ. I have been dealing this night with Almighty God to know the event of this affair, and I have gotten it. As sure as God is in heaven, they are delivered into our hands, and there shall not a man of us fall to the ground, end quote. Strachan's veterans were the survivors of multiple purges by the Kirk party. They were experienced, they were godly, and they were determined. Some of Strachan's officers had questioned the piety of fighting on the Sabbath, but the imminent arrival of Montrose's force quieted those concerns. Strachan knew his man. Montrose knew that Leslie would be far to the south, and he believed that only a small contingent of Covenanter soldiers were nearby. Strachan dutifully revealed a single troop of cavalry to Montrose's outriders, while the rest of his force hid nearby. Montrose took the bait, because of course he did. In doing so, he left behind a very defensible position which Strachan, and perhaps Leslie, would have struggled to take. He broke camp at Carbisdale and rushed his force into action, eager for an easy victory. There would be an easy victory, but not for Montrose. Montrose sent his cavalry, about 40 men in total, ahead, followed by the rest of his 1,200-man army. Most of Strachan's army lay in wait, screened by tall and thick bushes, but some of the local levies were ordered on a path that would bring them into the royalist right flank. What followed was a perfectly executed ambush. At around three in the afternoon, Strachan revealed the trap. The troopers who had acted as bait suddenly wheeled around as the rest of Strachan's cavalry charged out of the bushes, backed up by the musketeers. Montrose's cavalry, led by Hurry, was surprised and almost immediately destroyed, with Hurry being captured. The horsemen, who had not been killed or captured, fled back the way they came, right into the advancing infantry. The Orkney levies panicked and fled en masse, just as Strachan's own levies appeared on their right flank. Many of the Orcadians drowned as they tried to cross the Kyle of Sutherland Estuary. The Danish and German mercenaries, more experienced than the militia, put up a fight, falling back to a defensible position in the woods. When they realised that the battle was over, though, they soon surrendered. Strachan had commanded around 650 men, the bulk of which were militia. In two hours, he'd destroyed a force almost twice the size of his own. Four to five hundred were killed outright, with another 200 drowned, and 400 were captured. The cost? Strachan claimed that he'd lost a single man, who drowned after over-enthusiastically chasing the fleeing Orcadians. Strachan himself had been shot, but the bullet bounced off his belt buckle, leaving him with just a bruise. 
many commanders claim that God was on their side before a battle. But I have to wonder if Strachan did indeed have a late-night chinwag with the man upstairs. Montrose was not killed or captured at Carbisdale. His horse had been shot out from under him, and when the battle was clearly lost, one of his surviving officers insisted that Montrose take his own horse and flee, because as long as Montrose lived, so too did the cause of the king. Montrose ran with just three others. He was blocked from heading back north, where his garrisons had been so carefully left, so instead he fled west. One of his companions died of his wounds shortly after the battle. Another deserted the Marquis and went home. Montrose and his last ally roamed the hills for three days and two nights, disguised as shepherds, before they reached the home of Neil MacLeod of Assint. Given food and drink, they were offered a guide to take them further along their journey. Instead, they were led right into Covenant of Captivity at Ardvrek Castle. The betrayal of Neil MacLeod owes a lot to local politics, as well as the substantial reward offered and eventually granted to him. It was romanticised by royalists, and MacLeod would have to defend himself in court multiple times after the Restoration. We will cover Montrose's end next week, as Charles comes to terms with the Covenanters. This will spark a reaction from England, as the English Parliament and the Council of State summoned Oliver Cromwell home from Ireland. The final war of the Wars of the Three Kingdoms is about to begin. When it's over, the young Charles II will be hiding up an oak tree, and Cromwell will be firmly on the path towards rule. Thank you to my House of Lords, including but not limited to the King's favourite Mike Sanders, the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersich, the Marquess of Coventry, Liam Hunter, and the Earl of Darlington, David Metcalf. Go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica to join their ranks and listen to the podcast without ads. Remember that you can join the mailing list to get news about the show by going to the link in the description. For other great podcasts on the Airwave network, check out airwavemedia.com. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening. My brother-in-law died suddenly, and now my sister and her kids have to sell their home. That's why I told my husband we could not put off getting life insurance any longer. An agent offered us a 10-year, $500,000 policy for nearly $50 a month. Then we called SelectQuote. SelectQuote found us identical coverage for only $19 a month, a savings of $369 a year. Whether you need a $500,000 policy or a $5 million policy, Select Quote could save you more than 50% on term life insurance. For your free quote, go to SelectQuote.com. SelectQuote.com. That's SelectQuote.com. Select Quote. We shop, you save. Full details on example policies at SelectQuote.com slash commercials.